UW360 is proudly supported by BECU, a not-for-profit, member-owned credit union. Pacific Office Automation, copy, print, workflow, and IT. Problem solved. We've seen it too often in the Puget Sound region. Rivers flood, property is damaged or destroyed, and lives are disrupted. So how do we avoid future disasters? One would argue, one would hope, that the best policy would be based on the most information. University of Washington faculty members Dave Montgomery and Bob Freitag are experts about rivers and about the communities that line their banks. Dave is a geomorphologist. He studies how Earth's landscapes are formed and how they change over time. Bob studies hazards and how humans can withstand those hazards. All rivers flood. Uh, but when they, when they do flood, uh, we've tried to kind of control them and kind of put them into uh, to a box. We've, you know, developed a channel, we've built dams, uh, assuming that we really can manage and control them, and we can't. One of the reasons that uh, one would study the historical behavior of rivers and sort of the nature of how they work is to try and better understand the root causes of flooding problems and better design solutions, whether it's avoiding the problem or a better design to actually mitigate the problem. Bob's and Dave's research converges in the lowlands of Puget Sound, where the Green and some other rivers are actually higher than the land surrounding them. One of the things we've learned in studying rivers around Puget Sound over the last couple decades is that there's really two very fundamentally different kinds. We tend to think of rivers always being at the bottom of the valley because that's sort of normally what you find when you go out in the mountains and look at a river. But these certain kinds of lowland rivers, of which the Green River is an example, tends to be uh, located on high ground near the middle of the valley. It sort of has built its own wedge of sediment as it's been transporting material down from the uplands down to the Puget Lowland. And a river that sits above its valley bottom, that's a recipe for flooding. Land use planning needs to consider the unique and potentially dangerous nature of our rivers. Perched rivers, when they flood, fill the surrounding basin with water. In the lowest points of the Green River Valley, floodwaters could cover the roof of a home. Picture New Orleans after Katrina, or picture the Green River Valley until the year 1962. In that year, the Howard Hansen Dam was completed. To control flooding, the dam held back excess water in a reservoir. A system of levees at the river's edge provided additional flood protection. As a result, over the next 50 years, the Green River Valley transformed from a landscape filled with farms to one filled with business and residential developments. As long as the, the dam was working, the system worked pretty well. It did not allow high flows to impact the, the region. A lot of the floods were cut off. But in 2009, after a winter of deep snow and heavy rains, leaks appeared in an earthen abutment anchoring the dam, severely compromising its structural integrity. With a primary failsafe protecting the Green River Valley no longer fully functional, the valley now faces the potential return of catastrophic floods. The water would uh, really reach to about where that black panel of glass is, that row, and uh, the building would be filled with water. Now, the building really should not have been here. This area was a natural storage area, natural wetland, but it was built here when there was the perception that this area was protected, that the dam would work and the levee system would work. Now what can they do? Well, currently what's being suggested for these people really is to have a contingency plan. Uh, to have a plan where they have their, door, their, their data storage elsewhere, where they have uh, people uh, experienced to operate out of their home for a short period of time, where materials can be stored. The Green River is a poster child for sort of some of the downside of flood control for the simple reason that when the flood control system was designed, it was promised to essentially cut off all high flows so you'd never have to worry about the valley bottom being flooded again. Uh, sounds great as long as it works. The research conducted by Dave and Bob questions the advisability of placing millions of dollars of businesses and homes in harm's way. Instead, policymakers should read the landscape and design development around inevitable flooding. For instance, along the Green River, Bob suggests moving levees back from the river's edge and allowing lower, undeveloped areas to flood. This would store water that would otherwise spread across the landscape. They're going to have to restructure uh, the environment to accept more flooding, to move the levees back, and to really create areas, overflow areas, within the community uh, that are really lower than the river to accept some of this flow. 
Bob also suggests developed areas be designed with floods in mind. You can elevate structures within those areas and have a, a rescue system or an evacuation system that can accommodate flooding. And in areas that aren't yet as developed as the Green River Valley, there are other design options. You can build an environment of parks and waterways and canals and uh, streets that can accommodate water. The Netherlands have done it. Uh, you know, we have done it in some of the areas, and so this is possible. But we have to think of uh, a flood-resistant community. The best strategy, say Bob and Dave, is to respect the geology of our peculiar perched rivers and acknowledge that no flood control measures are foolproof. The estimates of a, you know, a levee breach kind of flood in the Green River Valley are you're talking billions of dollars worth of damage. Is it worth it in the end? That's the kind of question that's pertinent to sort of looking at flood control on other rivers around Puget Sound. Because 50 years from now, people may look back and sort of wonder why we didn't learn the lesson of the Green River in terms of managing the other rivers around Puget Sound. That's the real value of sort of looking at how the topography works, how the physiography works, how the geomorphology works, and trying to connect it to public policy.